So I've got this friend, I'll call him John. John's first exposure to the whole concept of hell was when he was watching a Tom and Jerry cartoon when he was younger. And what was intended to be this humorous cartoon all of a sudden turned into this hellacious nightmare when Tom did something bad to Jerry and was thrown into hell as a result. And later, John was at his church and he was talking with an older man about what he'd seen. And the older man looked at John and said, John, you don't want to go to hell, do you? John said, no. And so the man looked back at him and said, okay, pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, John kind of paused. There's some awkward silence, and then he realized he was supposed to say exactly what the man had said. So he said, Dear Jesus, and the man continued, I know that I'm a sinner, and I believe that Jesus died for my sins, and I ask you to come into my heart and save me. And then when they were finished, the man looked at John and said, Son, now you can know that you are saved from your sins, and you don't ever have to worry about hell again. Is that true? Is this really what it means to become a disciple of Jesus? Is this really what it means to follow him? You look back at the first disciples in the Bible, and when Jesus came up to them and said, follow me, that was not an invitation to pray a prayer. That was a summons for these men to lose their lives. But somewhere along the way, 2,000 years later, amid varying cultural tides and popular church trends, we have virtually missed that call. With good intentions, with sincere desires to reach as many people as possible for Jesus, we've taken challenging words from Christ and turned them into trite phrases in the church. And in the process, we've drained the lifeblood out of Christianity and replaced it with a watered down version of the gospel that is so palatable, it's not even real anymore. And the consequences are catastrophic. Scores of men, women, and children culturally identify themselves as Christians today who biblically are not followers of Christ. Is that possible? Absolutely it is. In fact, according to Jesus, it's probable. He said at the end of his most famous sermon, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles, and I will tell them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Those are some of the most frightening words in all of the Bible. As a pastor, I stay awake some nights, haunted by the thought that many people, many people who are sitting in church on Sunday will be shocked to stand before Jesus one day and hear him say to them, I never knew you. Away from me. We desperately need to take a look at our lives and our churches and ask the question, are we really, biblically, personally following Jesus? Eternity is dependent on how we answer that question. Well, I want to ask you, friends, who, what, and how are you following today? If what we just heard is true, then you understand these are questions of eternal importance. Who, what, and how are you following today? Let me ask you another question. Is that question really important? Is your answer really important? Is it important because Jesus said it directly, or is it important because it's found in God's Word? These are questions that need to be answered, and I pray that today you will see in God's Word that God and His Word have answered these questions. I want to come to you today as the writer of Hebrews came to those that would receive this letter this sermon, what we know as one of the books in the New Testament. And I want to fulfill a promise that I made when we came back after our family's sabbatical a couple of years ago. And my hope is, my prayer is, that today I will preach this sermon the way Jesus preached. And that you will find in here His truth and His love. The love that is His truth. And that you'll be impacted, changed forever, I pray. 
Now let me remind you, we're in the book of Hebrews and we're coming to a close as we look at for the third week, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. As we close out this verse on our way to the close of the book of Hebrews, let me remind you, if you haven't been with us, that the book of Hebrews, in context, it's written not long after the church had been birthed and was building, but it was coming under attack. And those that profess to be Christ followers, those who profess to be the church, were in some circles beginning to shrink back and fall away, beginning to buckle under the weight of the persecution and the pressure that it was to be a Christian. And there were many who were trying to find a rationale in the midst of that disobedience. And to such people, the letter of Hebrews was written. To us, the letter of Hebrews was written. This is the word of God. And my prayer is that you'll come to appreciate that it's not just the red letters that you're to follow in your Bible. In fact, it's not just the Bible that you're to follow, but you're to follow the Lord through his leaders as they bring to you the truth that is in God's word, that reflects God's will, that demonstrates God's ways. This is the message of Hebrews. This is the message of the Bible. This is the message of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Let me tell you where we will go this morning, and then I pray take you there to the glory of God and as an extension of His grace. We're going to see in Hebrews 13, verse 17, and if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to come there with me. We're going to see Christian objectivity. We're going to see Christian responsibility. And then we're going to see Christian accountability. All per God in His Word. The big idea or the timeless truth that I pray that you'll take away from here is that biblical... Christ-like obedience and submitting are both gospel fruit and the validating heartbeats of Christian blessing and true countercultural sanctification. That's what you'll see here, and it's consistent with all of God's Word. Friends, let me read for you the Scripture. Hear God's word this morning and heed God's word, I pray. That's the name of the sermon today. Did you heed that? Hear God's word. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be unprofitable to you. Lord, I pray that in the coming hour you will get me out of the way, that your word and your spirit will feed and lead your people to a place that brings you glory and demonstrates your grace. May we exemplify lives that are lived out to the fullness of the gospel truth. May we carry you, our treasure, to a lost and dying world. And may you use us to help to build up your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, let's jump right in. Let's look first at the objectivity. And because we've done this now for three weeks, I'm going to go rather quickly through the objectivity and the responsibility because we've already been there. So those that have been with us, remember this. And those that are here now with us for the first time, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to or watch our previous two sermons because some of what you hear now will be greatly embellished and built up in those previous two sermons. But here's God's word. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Note this, that both blessing and being begin with believing and obeying. This is the starting line, if you will, of the Christian faith. To understand what God is saying to us here is the obey, it is an exhortation. 
we know that all of Hebrews itself is an exhortation. We're told that in Hebrews 13, 22. So this is at the heart of the exhortation. Obey and submit. This is Christian objectivity in the form of exhortation. And I said to you that obedience, biblically understood, Christ-like in its application, it's a dirty word to the devil. He doesn't want to see you or me obey. Think to his first words in the, in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? He works with doubt to get to disobedience. And know this, that his strategy, we talked about it, it's very, very open. It's old, but it works, and that's why he sticks with it. First, he tries to get you to resist with all of what you have. Resist obedience. And then once you have resisted obedience to the point of disobedience, then he wants you to rationalize your disobedience. You and I see it all over the place. It starts in here. We have to fight this in ourselves. We noted as well that there's personalization in this objectivity because he says, obey your leaders. Your makes it personal. And it both points out who it is to obey, you are, and who you are to obey. The next word, your leaders. It's a powerful, powerful word where you see an intended audience, you know that God has an expected adherence. He's saying to you that have leaders, follow them, obey them. And who are the leaders? They are your divinely appointed delegation. They are truly heaven-sent overseers to the extent that they are bringing to you God's word, God's will, God's ways, that they are truly God's leaders. You and I here see that we're called, we're commanded here. This is God's word. Not red letters, but it's God's word. And I say to you again, are you going to listen to and obey all of what God has to say? Because right here, right now, He's saying, obey your leaders, this delegation. The ones that we see in Ephesians 4, God has said, are called to equip you, followers, to equip the family of God, the shepherds that equip the sheep in the flock, those that are, as we've seen again with Neil Cole, the apostles that look like the thumb on the hand, the prophets who tell you what God really says as the index finger points, the evangelist that goes out further than any other finger to reach the lost, the loving shepherd on the ring finger that serves as that shepherding pastor, and the picky little teacher that gets into the pointy cracks and crevices of your life with the truth of God's word. God has given these leaders this delegation, heaven-sent, hand-picked, divinely set in God's family per the Father, God himself. I wonder if you realize that obeying your leaders is obeying your Lord. Do you see that this now comes together? Obeying your leaders is obeying your Lord. Conversely, to disobey your leaders is to disobey your Lord to the extent that your leaders are truly representing the Lord. This verse is so powerful. It also brings with us this and. Obey your leaders and Submit to them. The and is a conjunction. It says, wait, there's more. You don't just obey, you must also submit. And we've said that if you look at this verse, verse 17, and you bring it back to verse 7, you realize that what God is telling us here is that you and I are to remember those leaders who truly bring you God's word. Remember and then consider the outcome of their lives. Look to the real le leaders and how they've lived their life in love with the Lord to remember, to consider, and then ultimately to imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. How? By obeying them now here in verse 17 and submitting to them the way, here it is, here's the imitation, the way Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow the Lord. You are to follow, to submit to, to obey as they do the Lord. How do they know? Per God's word, which shows God's will, which exemplifies God's ways. This is so, so powerful and so important. Now we noted as well at the end of the objectivity is that we are to submit. The way that Jesus submitted to the will of the Father, the leaders are to submit to the Lord, and the followers are to submit to the leaders who are submitting to the Lord, who is showing us the way. I said to you that submitting... It both complements and it contrasts obedience. Obedience is the mechanical that can be done with the hands. But the submitting requires the missional application of the heart. 
we looked at this very closely and I said to you that obeying is to do. Submitting is to resist resisting. It's to bring a wholeheartedness and a right heartedness into the equation. Some of you have been in our Bible study this morning. Jonah is a perfect example of one who obeyed. He obeyed, but he didn't submit. His hands were in, his head was negotiating, and his heart was far away. Biblically, you are called to, commanded to, obey and submit to your leaders who are leading for the Lord in the authority of the Lord, under the headship of the Lord. And as we noted, where that's not true, you don't do it. Now, some say, I, I'm not sure I like that in principle. Well, it's Jesus who said in John 13, 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, amen and amen, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And those who receive me receive the one who sent me. So understand the weight that is in this witness and this word. I said to you, it's critical that you understand this. And, and I wanted to make sure that you got the principle of the call here to obey and submit. Let me just bring it to you again in another context, another way to think about it. In terms of taking these truths to the Lord and receiving them from the Lord so that you'll better understand how to apply this word when it comes to your leaders. Watch this and then we'll pick right back up. Follow me. Two simple words that changed everything. At least it changed everything for those simple fishermen that day when Jesus called them by name. It was an invitation to leave all and come follow after this rabbi, this teacher of Nazareth. See, it was here on the Sea of Galilee that the very first disciples of Jesus Christ were called, invited to follow in the footsteps and learn the way of this master teacher. Jesus Christ. It was Peter, James, John. They were out doing what fishermen love to do, try to catch some fish. In fact, Jesus called out to them and said, hey guys, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And when they did, they brought in such a large catch of fish that it says their boats began to sink. So they quickly made their way back here to the seashore. And Jesus said to them, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. Come follow after me. Be my disciples. Now, to be invited to be a disciple of a rabbi was a huge honor. Very few were chosen or selected. And to be a disciple, in the Hebrew that word is Talmud, meant that you would set your life aside to study the life of your rabbi. See, a disciple doesn't just want to know what a rabbi knows. It goes so much deeper than that. A disciple wants to be as the rabbi is. And so he would study his life, his actions, the way he walked and talked and the, the way he lived and the way he prayed and even the way he ate his food so as to emulate and follow and pattern their life after the rabbi teacher. There's an old Jewish proverb that says, may you be covered in your rabbi's dust. Now, that's actually a blessing. It meant that if you were good enough to be chosen to follow after a rabbi, then you would practically be following him from village to village, walking right behind him in his footsteps. And the prayer was that may you walk so closely behind the rabbi that as the dust kicks up from his sandals, that it, it covers you. It was a sign of commitment and passion in following your rabbi. That's exactly the kind of commitment and passion that these early disciples had. Right here on the Sea of Galilee, they left their nets and their boats behind, their reputations, their security, their, their professions to follow after, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus of Nazareth. See, I think in our Western culture, we don't really understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We use the word Christian as equivalent to disciple. Yet there are many people who call themselves Christians that never study after Jesus. They never study his life and his ways to emulate him, to live the way he lived, to love as he loved, to give 
and to serve the way he did. See, to be a disciple is so much more than being a follower. When Jesus walked around these hills, around the Galilee, he had thousands that followed after him. Maybe to see his miracles that he performed, to hear his teachings, or maybe to get a free lunch when he broke that bread and the fish that day on the hillside. But then there were the 12 that were the Talmudim, the disciples, the followers that were close to him. Now here's what's beautiful. That's not limited to 12. It's not limited to just a few. Jesus invites you and me to come follow in his footsteps, to walk in his ways, to emulate his life. When Jesus says to us, follow me, let's follow so closely behind that were covered in the dust of our rabbi. My prayer is that from now on, you and I will come to understand this is Christian objectivity. Jesus said, follow me. We know from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all of his word is God-breathed. And so where and when here in Hebrews we're commanded to obey and submit to our leaders, that we come to understand this is an extension of what it is to follow and obey the Lord himself. Think of it this way. Biblical submitting is right-hearted and wholehearted faithful obedience. And how important is this? I pray that you see that it's faithful obedience that is at the very heart of the gospel's invitation. Think of John 3.36. It's at the heart of saving faith. Think about Jesus in the Great Commission, obeying faithfully all that he commanded is at the heart of the message of our mission. John 14, 15 says that if you, owe, if you love me, you'll obey me. It's at the heart of love. This faithful obedience, it's at the power source and the expression of the witness that we're promised to become in Acts 1, 8. It's at the heart of the blessing that is promised, John 14, 21. It is the actual evidence of the presence and the power of Almighty God in us, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. And the disobedience that is its flip side, it's at the core of all that is broken in creation. It's at the core of all the sin that is in you and me still and all around us in the world. Disobedience is at the core of the deception that comes through the snakes and the wolves that are out there. It's at the heart of the destruction that is found in the relationships that are still broken and breaking in the world around us. Disobedience is at the heart of damnation. Disobedience is what brought us the cross of Christ. Now it didn't keep the cross down and praise God it's a, a story of glory and grace in the gospel. But make no mistake it was disobedience that brought all of this in. That's how important it is. And it helps you and me to understand why the responsibility, the Christian responsibility that's in the middle of this verse now becomes so important. You see, obeying and submitting to your leaders is obeying and submitting to your Lord. How do we know that? The second part of the verse. For they are keeping watch over your souls. Those that the Lord has appointed are leading by watching over your souls. We know that this is a responsibility that the leaders carry. And in one sense, the leaders are like everybody else. We're all going to give an account before Jesus one day for what we did with what he gave us. And leaders especially know this. We're going to be held to a higher standard. We, more than anybody else, will have to acknowledge, yes, we have received much and much was expected of us. And we say, thank you. Thank you for that privilege and this responsibility. And my prayer is that you'll see through this responsibility given to the leaders that biblical leaders have been put in your life per this passage, Ephesians 4, and so many others so that we, we are here to help equip you to do the work of the ministry. We're here to equip you through your obeying and submitting to God of the Word, the Word of God, the leaders of God, and then the, the mission that God has given the people of God, we're here to help lead you to become one of those faithful followers that will one day hear, well done, come on home, well done. That's our purpose. And that's what it means to, to literally watch over, keep watch over. We talked about this at length. This is a sleepless, deep devotion 
to helping you to be all that Christ has called, created, commanded, and commissioned you to be, Christian. That's what the leaders are here to do. I said to you, beware those who are overly delicate, damaged, those that are delinquents, those that are delusional, those that are divisive, deceptive, the dancing deal makers that will tell you what your itching ears want to hear. And then I said to you, it's like Jesus who's drawing the same contrast out by comparing his real under shepherds with the hirelings. And I said to you in that contrast, real shepherds versus the hirelings, that the real shepherd will truly feed God's sheep where the hirelings will fool God's sheep. The real shepherds will lead God's sheep, whereas David Platt said, the hirelings, they'll bleed out God's sheep. The real shepherds will protect, whereas the hirelings will treat people not as those to be protected, but they'll be projects. The real under shepherds will prepare God's sheep. The hirelings will pervert God's sheep. The real shepherds will disciple God's sheep and the hirelings will deceive God's sheep. Watch out. It's so important to understand the responsibility that the leaders have as Christians. It's to give you a sense of, wow, look at God's grace that he is, he is not only done for us personally, but he's done for us purposely by giving us these leaders. What a loving God we have that he would put such a system in place of saints that are here to serve as sent ones in the sanctifying process. What a blessing we have. And it brings us to the responsibility that now can be seen in the accountability. The accountability. The verse begins to shift, and here you'll see in responsibility a shift to accountability. And in this accountability, you're going to see a new responsibility as well as the accountability. Let me, let me read it to you from God's Word, and then we'll unpack it. You see, those that are going to be watching over your souls, they're doing it as those who will have to give an account. I wonder if you've ever thought about what that means. Have you thought about the health of your soul? Have you thought about an account that will be given directly in relationship to the health of your soul? Let me show you this in in hopes of helping you to understand your soul so that you'll better understand your leaders, which will help you to better understand your Lord, and I pray impact your love. Watch this, and then we'll come back. We are made up of a spirit, soul, and body. And the body is very obvious. If you go look in a mirror, that's the part that you see. Now, you would be speaking to my soul, which is my mental, emotional part, Some people define soul as your mind, will, and emotions, and I think that that certainly is true. I don't think that it's all-inclusive. There's more to it. I believe that your conscience is a part of your soul. Your soul certainly includes your mental, emotional part. Uh, I believe it's what most people call their personality. If I was to touch your physical body, you can feel that. But I can also touch you by words, and it can touch your emotions. It can either make you glad or sad. It can make you angry. Uh, You can say words and hurt a person. So the body and the soul are two areas that every one of us are in touch with constantly. But the spirit part of us is a totally different matter. Jesus said this in John chapter 3 when he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And there is no direct connection between the two. You cannot in a physical, natural way feel your spirit. The spirit cannot be accessed in any natural way, and herein lies one of the great problems in the Christian life. The Spirit is the part of us that God communicates with. And the Spirit is the part of us that all of the life and the power of God flows through. In James chapter 2, verse 26, the scripture there says, As the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And that just makes it very clear that the life-giving part of you is the Spirit. One of the greatest keys to walking with the Lord for me has been to understand this 
reality of spirit, soul, and body, that the spirit realm cannot be seen or felt. The only way to discern what is spiritual truth is through the Bible, to just take it and believe it. Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 63. He says, the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's revealing to us spiritual reality. And if you want to know what your spirit is like, then you have to go to God's word to find it out. You can't just go by an emotion, by some type of perception. You have to go to God's word. Here's another passage of scripture in James chapter 1. And in verse 23, it says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. This is talking about a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, talking about God's word, specifically the revelation of the gospel, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This passage of scripture is likening the Bible unto a mirror that you look in to see your spiritual face, to see what you are in the spirit. You with your eyes have never looked directly into your face. You've always looked at a reflection or a representation, but you've gotten to where you trust that. Well, the word of God is a perfect reflection of what spiritual truth is. You can't sit there and say, well, I think that, you know, all my mascara is on and that my face is fixed, my hair is combed, and I'm ready to go. You can't go by how you feel. You have to go look in that mirror, and then you trust what you see. Well, it's the same thing with the Word of God. The Word of God gives you a perfect picture of who you are. You and I can trust the Word of God to tell us who we are. You and I can trust the Word of God to tell us what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and it is both the authority and the reflection to us that should guide us. Now, think about this. We're, we're told that the leaders will give an account. That word account is logos. It's the Word. And, and here's what I want you to realize. As we talk about accountability from the platform of responsibility, is you need to understand that this account it's not going to be as though the leader is now in a place of needing to defend their actions. No, this account is going to be the leader giving an account of the followers. This is, this is huge. This is huge to understand. Because again, it's going to impact the relationship. Now note this, God's speaking to the followers. Obey and submit. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to the leaders? No, he's talking to the followers. He's saying, obey and submit to your leaders. Now, they're going to give an account for how they oversaw your souls. What's at stake here? Souls are at stake. But the account for he's going to give or they are going to give an account. Well, the answer there is going to be like a babysitter talking to the parents at the end of a night. When the parents say, so how were the kids? And the babysitter says, well, let me give you an account of the night. That's what this is going to be like. That's why I said to you, you, you don't want to be in an unhealthy relationship with your leaders. Number one, because God says not to be. But also, it's like arguing with your barber when you're in the barber chair. Arguing with your surgeon during the middle of open heart surgery. That these are the divinely appointed, heaven-sent overseers of your soul's on your journey with Jesus or on your journey to Jesus or those that are there to help you with a journey into eternity. And to see this, we've noted the heart of this leader, this biblical leader. The heart is there. Like uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, where we're told that we didn't, Paul says, just share with you the gospel, but out of our affection, out of our love for you, we shared our very lives with you. So these leaders are truly loving. And at the same time, they're going to bring to you an understanding of the responsibility and the accountability that will come to you as sheep. I want you to hear the rest of the verse. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, 
for that, the causing of groaning, would be unprofitable for you. In the close, you see cooperation, let them. You see coordination, let them do this, what? Oversee your souls. You see that you're going to have a contribution here. You're either going to add joy or you're going to add groaning to this. And then there's a place for contemplation. For this would be unprofitable for you. And that's where I would like to end with a time of personal consultation for you. So let's look at this. Remember, when the scripture says here, let them, you're being called to cooperate. And remember that obedience like faith is an act of the will. Consequently, if and when you disobey, you will never be able to stand before God as a victim of your own decision making. You will never stand before Christ as a victim of your own decision. Let them. Let them do this. Do what? Oversee your soul. Followers can either help or hinder leaders. And here you see that Christians are commanded to cooperate with those coordinations that his leadership has placed in love over his family. Let them do this. Now, are you going to be a part of the coordination of cooperation? Or will you be like so many who want to hold on to their own power and lordship, who are not a part of the cooperation and coordination, but rather they're building their own coffin of corruption. I'm in charge. I want what I want. I will do what I want to do. Friend, is your contribution, are you bringing Jesus and joy to your leaders? Or are you bringing grumbling and groaning? You see, grumbling is that which comes out of the heart that says to God, you know what, God, it's not just that this situation is hard, you're hard. It's not just, Lord, I don't like this situation. It's I don't like you right now. It's that kind of grumbling. And it leads to the groaning of the leaders. I want to just speak to you for a few minutes, three minutes here, on understanding better the, the risk and the weight of grumbling. Watch this. Grumbling is testing God. Don't try and fool yourself. When you're complaining, when you're getting all negative and grumbling about what's going on in your life, you're doing it against the Lord. We always hear about sins like idolatry, pagan revelry, sexual immorality, lots and lots of stuff on that, but hardly anything on grumbling and complaining, which gets listed right up there with them. Paul talks about these things and their consequences in Corinthians when he says, do not be idolaters, as some of them were. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Serious stuff. He said, we should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Serious, serious word here. But where's the grumbling part? Did you miss it? It's right there at the end, closely related to the testing of the Lord. The them Paul is referring to in that verse is the nation of Israel, who shortly before had been set free from slavery in Pharaoh's Egypt. They were all on their way to the land that God had promised them when they heard a report from scouts about that land. The scouts told them, we went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very, very large. When the Israelites heard this, they started to yell and to cry. They all began to, quote, grumble, unquote, and said, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taking as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Huh? They wanted to go back to slavery to their lives before God? The Bible says that this is treating God with contempt. It's a lack of faith, lack of trust, and refusal to believe in spite of what God has already done. Because of this testing and grumbling, not one of those complainers was allowed to enter into the promised land. They wandered around in the desert for 40 years until each one had died because of grumbling. 
The Israelites were sinning when they grumbled. It's not just the loud yelling grumbling, but the little quiet under your breath muttering grumbling too. They were unable to trust because they were unable to remember that God had already delivered them out of Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea, provided food and water in the desert. That's all of us. Remember all that God has done for us. Be humble. Don't grumble. So be humble, don't grumble. Your grumbling will lead to your leaders groaning. And that's the point here, is allow your leaders to lead with joy in as much as you are a dependent part of that equation. Listen to what Kevin DeYoung said in this regard, quote, Grumbling is one of, the, one of those sins that we universally dislike when we see it in others, and we invariably approve of it when we find it in ourselves. De Young goes on and he says, it, it's like the, the Winnie the Pooh cartoon. He says, nobody wants to be around an Eeyore. Oh, they took my tail again. Everybody's looking to hang out with Tigger. Woohoo! here we go. He said, as far as you can add to the dynamic of the emotional stability and health of your leader, be a Tigger. Have the heart that feeds into your leadership. I would ask it to you this way, and, and I'd ask you to just take this to heart. Ask yourself, am I truly following or am I frustrating my leadership? To the extent that they are God-sent and biblical, am I following or am I frustrating those that the Lord has put over me? Now it leads us to that last part of the verse, for that would be unprofitable for you. And I'll just simply close this down here at this part with this observation. Take it to heart, friend. Sin will never ultimately end well. Sin will never ultimately end well. Even where the Lord shows up with mercy and grace and he grows flowers out of the manure, turns it into fertilizer, there will be a price to be paid for every sin. And we need to understand that. And this, to go against the command of God and his word, is sin. Disobedience, friend, is that choice for which you'll never be able to claim victimhood. If it's your choice, it's your choice. If it's your decision, it's your decision. And here we're being called to consider. Think of 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourself. Test yourself whether or not to see you're in the faith. Say, well, yeah, but that's a gospel-based. That's right. And if you are, your gospel-based believing will show up in obeying. That's John 3, 36. That's John 14, 5, 15. John 14, 15. If that's true, this is you. If that's true, this is you. If it's not, it's not. Not my word. That's God's word. Think about this and ask yourself, Why? Because we've learned in Hebrews, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I would say it to you this way, that there's only, only a quick look into the Bible that's needed to realize that in the same way that sin is the opposite of faithful obedience, hell is the opposite of heaven. And just as unimaginable are the heights of heaven, so it is with the depths of hell. And it's truth and love that calls you to faithful obedience, to submitting, to not be a Jonah, but to follow Jesus no matter what. The stakes are so high. Souls are in the balance. Eternity is found in this definition, this DNA. Before we close, I want you to have one other voice speaking this truth and love into you in a way that I pray will arrest your attention and draw you to the Almighty. Watch this and then we'll close. I've been studying this book for over 30 years, deeply, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in English, just over and over. Try to read through this book at least once a year because I want to know the truth. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to count on someone else telling me what it says. Best I, and I could be wrong. I'm a human being, but I'm just saying, man, 
best I can understand this book and what Jesus says about following him, here's what I am most concerned about, to put it as plainly as I can. I am deeply concerned that even though you are sitting in a church building, that some of you one day will go to hell to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And by the time you figure it out, it'll be too late. That's my biggest concern. Look, I, I don't, look, I have a couple of fears. One fear is I don't want anyone thinking they're going to heaven if they're not. That's horrible. And the most loving thing is not to just let people go and not offend them and wait till they figure it out at the end. But I also have another fear, man. I don't want people who know Jesus to feel like they don't and be worried about it. <laughs> and how to walk that tension and go, God, I don't want to just get everyone worried about their salvation. At the same time, I don't want everyone just to assume that they're saved. And so you just, you just go, I don't know how to differentiate the two. I, don't, I just try to get away from myself as much as I can and just read the words of Scripture and let it happen. But I, I tell you, I've been... I, that's what, if I'm completely honest right now, that's what I care about. I know some of you guys are struggling in your marriages, and I care, but not as much as I care about this. Some of you are struggling with sickness, and I, I care, but not as much as this. Some of you are dealing with racial tension. Some of you are, are dealing with the loss of a job, and I care, but not nearly as much as I care about this, because this is forever, okay? This is forever. You're gonna, we're all going to stand before this God. And he's going to say one of two things for you, and it lasts forever, forever. Either well done, good and faithful servant, man, come over here, man, you, you're my son, you're my daughter, get over here forever and ever, or depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, one of the, one of the passages that caused me to get into Christian ministry was when I read uh, Matthew 7, verse 21, where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And right before he was talking about, man, you can tell the good tree by the good fruit. Because not everyone who just says to me, Lord, Lord. And as I read that passage, it, it's showing me, it says in the last day, many people, many are going to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? And it says, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so clearly in that passage, there are people who are deceived it seems from the language that they're going to get to the end and go, well, wait a second, I thought for sure I was getting, what are you talking about? I did this, I taught Sunday school, I hardly ever missed a day of church, I was raised in the church. They told me, just come forward, pray a prayer. Man, I did that prayer, well, what's going on here? There are many people who will think, but they're going to be deceived. That terrifies me. That scares me. And so if you want to know what I care about and what I see in Scripture, it's these passages where I go, man, I'm concerned. I, man, what's a loving thing to do? Just kind of go, oh, let me give you a happy sermon today and let's all go feel better because life is tough. No, I think about the end. Look, life is a vapor. You're here one second and then you're gone. And so I just prayed. I go, God, if I were honest, loving, unafraid of what anyone thought, what would I say? I would go to some of these passages. I would go to the scripture because I'm afraid that someone lied to you and you didn't take the time to study this book for yourself so you don't even know. I'm, I'm afraid someone told you that there's no hell anymore. That's really popular. 
Man, when's the last time I even heard the word hell from a pulpit? Even in church. Why? Because someone's been lying to you. They're saying, how can a loving God punish? How could a loving God torture? That's what our world teaches. That's the popular teaching. But I'm not here to teach what's popular. I'm here to teach what's biblical. I'm saying if you study the Bible, read it yourself. Don't just let someone tell you it's done now. Start in Genesis. You'll read about a time when God actually drowned everyone on the planet. He was grieved that he made them. It's pretty early on. You only got to go like six chapters. Now, would a loving God drown everyone on the planet? Every man, woman, and child, and infant, a loving God did that? You'll read about a loving God who says to the Egyptians, hey, if you don't let my people go, I'll kill the firstborn of every household. Wait, wait, the, you'll kill? You'll send an angel to kill the firstborn of every house? Loving God. I'm not saying he's not a loving God. I'm just saying there's other parts of him. He's also a God of justice. He's a God of wrath. Read this book. And you go, oh, but you're quoting from Genesis. That's the way he used to be. Do I need to read the book of Revelation to you? You want to see how it ends to know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Listen, we have a God who is a God of love. He's a God of redemption. He's a God who wants to save. I mean, that's why he sent his son. But at the same time, nowhere in this book will you see people praying a prayer to accept Jesus as their savior. You'll see people who over and over said, repent, turn. You need to be born again. You got to start this thing all over. You got to die to yourself. That's what Jesus taught. People say, well, but John 3, 16, John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, keep reading. John 3, 36 says, he who, who believes in the son who has life, he who does not obey the son shall not see life and the wrath of God abides on him. Just keep reading. Read this book. It's about those who turn to Jesus, who recognize, man, I've been living for myself. Man, I'm like Adam and Eve. It's like, oh, that looks good. Let me get some of that. Let me pursue some of that. And it's like, no, you got to stop that. You got to turn from that and say, man, I used to just live thinking it was all about me. And even so many in the church still allow that type of thinking that God is here for you. So what do you need from him? And he, he'll just keep giving you and feed this self-centered mindset. No, it's about me turning from who Francis was and what he wants and saying, no, I'm a part of another kingdom now. I've got a citizenship here. Now you're my Lord. Where, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? I'm just going to say, I know some people hate this you know I'm going to lay it out because I'm a part of a different kingdom now I've repented you turn from yourself and you follow Jesus I, I studied one time because I was getting ready for an Easter sermon you know Easter is that that day where where everyone shows up and so you go, man, what do I say? What do I say? You get a little nervous thinking, man, if I say the right thing, maybe they'll come twice a year. You know, like, you, you know, all this pressure of how do I keep people in the church? So I began to study. I go, man, what did Jesus say when crowds showed up? Man, and it was shocking. He didn't say, oh, so glad you're here. Come back next week. You know, we got this program, this program, this. You won't want to miss that. That, he didn't say that. He, he, he did it. He said, yeah, then bring a friend. No, he, what he did, I started studying. I'm going, wow, Jesus, you said that? See, Jesus didn't beg. That was surprising. In fact, people begged him. He said, can I, can, can I, can I follow you? And the people would come to him, go, man, can I follow you? And he's like, man, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. You, you sure you want to follow me? Because I'm homeless tonight. 
I don't know where I'm sleeping. You want to follow me? That was Jesus. It wasn't just, oh, good, they showed up, you know, let, let's keep them there somehow. No, Jesus was honest. Jesus was so honest, so brutally honest. In fact, this week, early on Monday, I, I was having, a, or Tuesday, I don't remember, I, I was having breakfast with a friend of mine. And uh, this hedge fund guy, you know, was in, in town just uh, visiting. And, and he, he just, he said as we we're eating, he goes, you know, I did something the other day. I just opened my Bible and I just started reading all the letter, all the words in red. And I just read through the whole thing. Just, I just kept turning pages, 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 just reading. What did Jesus say? Because in my Bible, he says, all the words of Jesus are in red. So I just read them all, all of them. He goes, it doesn't take that long. Just read them all. And he goes, I was shocked. He goes, Jesus was direct. He goes, Jesus sure did sound a lot different from preachers today. And I go, man, what you did, I beg people to do. I beg them, man, stop listening to everyone else and get alone with the word of God and just read it. Read it for yourself. I mean, your eternity depends on it. You're not even going to read it. Man, take some time, understand the words of Jesus. Man, if you feel like, oh, no, I can't read that whole book. My eternity's not worth it. Just read the red part at least. Just start with that. Just read Jesus' words. It'll take you a couple hours. And just go, okay, everything I've been taught my whole life, how does it compare to what Jesus said? You'd be surprised. That's the problem, friends. Too many people would be surprised because they're not following godly leaders. Here's where I'll take you as we close. Back to the beginning. David Platt showed you and me just the simplicity of the command to follow Christ. Francis Chan has now reiterated this and what it looks like. Well, Hebrews 13, 17 says that you are to obey and submit to your leaders. That those that lead and love and live like Christ, you are to follow. As Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. Hebrews 13, 17 says, this is the command of God and his word. My admonishment, my exhortation to you is find those godly leaders that he tells you to follow. And then follow the leaders that you find that are truly in line. Why? I saw R.C. Sproul this week point out. That when Jesus says, in speaking of hell, that it'll be a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, he brought to the surface that in hell there will be people that are weeping. Oh, Lord, please, I can't believe I ended up here. Please, Lord, have mercy on me now. I'm so sorry you know that I meant what I said. And that will go on for eternity in the midst of torture, separated from Christ. But don't miss this. There'll also be those who will be gnashing their teeth. Gnashing of teeth is a way of pointing out and a metaphor for the fury of human beings. How dare you put me here? That will be hell, eternally. And I plead with you now to weep today that you don't gnash later. For there will never again be an opportunity for you to say that I'm a victim of my decision to live in disobedience. Because God in his word came today. Know that Jesus died that you could live. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way but to submit and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ laid out in the red letters and I pray presented to you through the redeemed leadership that he gave life to, to carry this truth and love to the world and to not make friends with the world and to not dilute it in any way, but to be a true ambassador of Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for the power, the promise, the purpose of your word that we could be your people. Let us not drift disconnect, dilly-dally, disobey, or deny or defy, like those for whom the letter of Hebrews was originally written. Let those of us for whom the letter of Hebrews was also written hear and heed your word. Oh, Lord, may we be a people who bring you glory, 
who exemplify your grace and who carry the gospel locally, regionally, and globally. May that bring us joy and may the groaning cease right here and right now. It's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen and amen. Well, I pray.